Hey everybody, welcome back to Terminus. Uh, I am, as always, the Death Metal Guy here with my comrade in arms, the Black Metal Guy, for a very special interview that uh, came to us as something of a surprise uh, offered to us just last week. Uh, the head of a label uh, from whom many records we have covered, a uh, stalwart warrior in the underground extreme metal scene, and soon to be the proprietor of a brand new vinyl pressing plant right here in the U.S. of A. I have Yosuke of Nuclear War Now Productions. Uh, Yosuke, it's wonderful to have you on the show, and uh, we're really excited to talk to you. And uh, how are you doing? How's your week been? Good, good. Just been busy doing a bunch of interviews and, you know, running NWN as usual. So, yeah, thank you very much for having me on this uh, podcast. Uh, the the uh, the pleasure, pleasure is definitely ours in this case. So, yeah. uh, I mean, I mean, right off the bat, let's talk about uh, Helios Press, the uh, the the big reason for this press junket that you're on right now. You want to just sort of uh, lay out the basics of your plans for that for the audience? Sure. So the basics are um, that I'm involved in creating a vinyl pressing plant with a friend of mine in Brady, Texas, and um, we announced this project after we've already acquired a building and four pressing machines. So we just didn't want to jump the gun and, uh, you know, announce something that wasn't possible. So we first made, made sure that the main things were out of the way, the building where the factory will reside, um, and four vinyl pressing machines that we've ordered from a German manufacturer. It's going to be brand new manual machines. We opted for manual machines rather than automatic ones that most people use these days uh, because there are just less moving parts and when things go wrong they're easier to fix and um, they cost a bit less. They're more customizable in terms of what you can press on there so you can do picture discs of all sizes um, you can do those crazy colored vinyl that you often see people doing, like splatter with um, different colors and uh, A side, B side, mush vinyl. Um, yeah, you can pretty much do put you know everything under the sun with the manual press. So that's what we that's why we went with them. The reason for choosing Brady, Texas, was somewhat um, accidental. Um, we were just looking online for buildings for sale and we started out with um, the NWN headquarters as the center and we just radiate, radiated outward from there and just looked at property and uh, there were some options but the price tag was too high. Um, we're self-financing most of this. We haven't taken on a loan yet. We might have to. Um, so we looked at some stuff in Austin, but as you know, Austin is a growing city. There are a lot of people moving here. Price of real estate is still very high, even though we're in a recession and interest rates are stupid. So we went out a little bit further out. We looked at Bastrop. We looked at San Marcos, Kyle, all the cities in between Austin and Houston, all the cities between Austin and San Antonio and we were pretty much priced out. So we started looking the other way into the center of Texas where there's just less stuff going on, mostly just um, cows and, uh, and you know, <laughs> concrete factories and like really nothing out there. It's a beautiful country, of course, um, but there were uh, multiple buildings in that direction. So we started looking at Lano. Lano was still a little too expensive, so we went out even further. Uh, basically, two hours out from where we are located right now is Brady, Texas, and that's where we found the magic number, so to speak, in terms of pricing. So we were able to get a 7,500 square foot building uh, for roughly 180,000, which is pretty amazing anywhere, you know, especially around the Austin area. Two hour radius isn't too bad considering the fact that um, to get to anywhere in Austin, it's like 30 minutes drive, you know, mm -hmm. from where I'm located <laughs> in Austin to get to downtown Austin, it's sometimes like 45 minutes. So if I have to go meet up, uh, meet up with a friend like uh, Cody from 
Dude Iron Will works at Hotel Vegas, so if I want to go in that direction and meet up with him, it's a good 40 minutes usually during the week. So, you know, two hours is not too bad considering. Um, and also, it's a nice little town. Um, I was a city person for a very long time living in California. And the reason why I left was because I just got sick of the just the, the busyness and the scumminess of big cities. Um, mm-hmm. and not, to, not to mention all the crime that comes with it, too. So I kind of like the fact that we're now in the suburbs of Austin in the middle of nowhere. And, and then the factory is going to be two hours inland in the middle of nowhere again, like even more so than here. So that's what's happening with the factory where um, it's going to be a completely separate uh, business from NWN. Um, so we will press for everyone. We're going to be musical genre um, agnostic meaning I'll press anything, you know, from rap to uh, country music, the spoken word, you know, even uh, stand-up comedy, whatever. We will press everything. We will not censor anything either. So, <laughs> Very good. Yeah. So, so, you know, making the leap from a label proprietor to someone that's fully involved in the physical production of music... Uh, you know, the only precedent I think I know of that, at least within the metal scene, is Deathgasm Records, because those guys started DGR Inc., which in some ways ended up sort of eclipsing the label and has become like a primary place that people get pro CDs printed. Uh, mm. What prompted you to move into that space? Was it just uh, seeing the niche given how long vinyl production times have gotten, or is it more of a personal passion of yours to get involved in that side of things? Um it's hard to say so my my little itch for wanting to go into manufacturing came about around 2019 2020 when i bought a bunch of printing equipment from 1984 printing uh they were located in the bay area they used to print a lot of my inserts and zines and stuff unfortunately uh the owner moved out of state and she closed down the shop and was selling it selling basically the entire shop I ended up buying as much as I could, and my idea was to start printing my own posters and inserts and then eventually maybe uh, magazines as well. But that dream kind of came to a halt when um, COVID hit and things started to get really hairy in the Bay Area, not to mention all the other factors like cost of living. I I basically evaluated my life during those shutdown years and uh, for months, I guess. And um, as a family, we decided to move, but that meant that I had to get rid of my equipment. There was no way to move these gigantic, heavy industrial equipment across the state. Um, And, you know, all the way to Texas, it's like a 25 hour drive. Just to get it on a truck, it would take some major heavy equipment. So we gave up on that idea of moving the equipment. I pretty much just gave it away. Some guy was supposed to give me a couple thousand dollars. He never did. He mm-hmm. just took the machines. I wish yeah. I could remember his name so I could, I could talk shit, but I'm not <laughs> I remember. Um, but anyways, uh, that's where I got the itch for manufacturing and like doing stuff with with your hands and uh, uh, and, and creating um, some sort of object, object kind of runs in my family. So going back generations all the way to my grandfather. They were all artists of different types, and my sister now still does pottery. My mom was doing lithograph. My father's still doing woodcut printing. My other sister's doing oil painting. So creation and the process of creation was always something that's been in my family. So it was kind of a natural leap from producer to manufacturer. I've always wanted to go into manufacturing. And I have some you know, idealistic views about wanting to bring manufacturing back to the States um, rather than outsourcing and globalization. I I was involved Mm -hmm. in the globalization, you know, part when I was working for Biotech. We were outsourcing to India. Manufacturing was leaving the U.S., you know. So um, I, 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 I had you know, front row seat to globalization for 20 something Mm -hmm. years when I was working for this company and I didn't like it. You know, on one hand, I went to India and all these people are very smart. 
and uh, uh, capable. Uh, but I just always wondered why, you know, why can't we just do this in the U.S. and pay these people a little bit more, you know. Um, I understand the business so, need. Um, I run a business myself, so I know, I know, you know, that we have to pay bills and the profit margin needs to make sense for investors and all of that. Um, but yeah, it still felt wrong yeah. and insourcing just felt like a good idea. So here we are with Helios Press. So, so how has, um, I guess, I don't, I mean, well, you would know this better than me, but maybe, uh, Maybe we couldn't really say that record manufacturing had been outsourced, but there's certainly much less of it in the U.S. Um, how so for you sourcing, uh, getting getting records made for NWN? How how has the sort of internationalization of mm -hmm. the uh, record pressing process affected you? And you know, so, what, what's it like? Because there must be a shortage of this sort of thing here. Yeah. So. Um, vinyl manufacturing was definitely outsourced. It was outsourced to Eastern Europe where labor is much cheaper mm. and there was already infrastructure for vinyl manufacturing during the Soviet era. So almost all records that you see released by metal labels, including myself, are pressed at GZ Media in the Czech Republic. So mm -hmm. that was a legacy, enormous factory. It's almost like a town that um, that exists like a little bit outside of Prague. I, I even visited that factory and pressed my own record there thanks to Pirate Express. Cool. So outsourcing definitely happened for vinyl manufacturing. So US used to have more factories. We still have uh, United. We still have, um, what's the one on the West Coast? A couple of them went out of business. So Rainbow Records went out of business. And oh, there's Cascade up north. Northwest, um, Bill Smith went out of business. Um, but yeah, there, there's one in Ohio called Got a Groove that's very popular these days. And my friend Chris Donaldson's opening one up in North Carolina. There's one in Florida. There are two or three in Texas, including um, Gold Rush in Austin. So mm -hmm. there are some smaller scale factories in the U.S., uh, but none of these really compare to the volume and prices that GZ can provide. Now, where we can compete is on shipping costs because international shipping is independent of you know the factory. So that's really driven yeah. by cost of oil. And I don't really see the cost of oil dropping anytime soon with you know three fronts of wars happening, Russia, Israel, and Middle East. Um, so I, I don't see oil prices dropping anytime soon, um, which is probably good for us, uh, probably not good for society at large, but at least for manufacturing in the U.S., I think it might have the effect of bringing back jobs to the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. So as far as I understand, uh, just... In, in me following the resurgence of vinyl pressing that, you know, really kind of started up in earnest in the mid to late 2000s. Uh, one of the problems I always heard was um, a sort of decay of institutional knowledge in the actual process of mm. pressing vinyl. Um, you know, the, the industry itself had decayed so far that there were relatively few people still alive and doing it who knew how to operate and maintain the machines. And it made constructing new ones extremely difficult. Is this something that the industry has sort of bounced back from? Or is it still kind of rarefied knowledge that's reestablishing itself? Some aspects of vinyl manufacturing is still um, protected by the old guard, but a lot of it is now being unlocked because uh, the machines themselves are getting made again. So there are multiple factories out there making brand new vinyl pressing machines. So the one that I'm getting is called New Built Machinery out of Germany. And uh, the most popular is probably Viral from um, Canada. They make the... Uh, warm tone automatic machines and then there's a new newer newer factory in sweden called alpha phoenix that's supposed to be very good and yeah and then there's um i think old machines are still getting fixed by 
uh, people from that generation. But yeah, that knowledge of fixing old machines is uh, quickly leaving. Uh, luckily, the new machines have support structure around them. Um, you can buy support contracts directly from the factories that make them. So at least that portion of the manufacturing process is okay. Now, upstream from that, um, not upstream, sorry, downstream from that, and upstream from what I do with you know selling records um, are other steps like lacquer cutting, lacquer manufacturing, which is a major issue because there was a factory making lacquers in the U.S. that actually burnt down during the pandemic. Mm. So now we're down to like one or two globally. Uh, PVC manufacturing, I think this is okay now. Um, there are two in the south of U.S. and there's a distributor for the Italian company in Texas, and uh, I think there's a distributor for the Thai company. So there are four, four or five places where most plants will get their vinyl pellets from. Um, and then the last step is the plating. So the you cut the lacquer, and then you have to plate the lacquer with um, chemistry that I don't fully understand but basically you coat it with different types of metal and then that is basically what makes the records so the stampers are what goes on the machines you put the puck of vinyl between them it smushes it and it heats it up at the same time so it goes into the grooves and this magic happens yeah, the, the actual process of the pressing is pretty fascinating. Uh, yeah. You know, it's, yeah, I've, I've never been one that, you know, had a, a particular fixation on analog media, but there is something really special about the idea of, you know, the, the very physical representation of every note you hear. Yeah. Right. So I'll, I'll try to convince you why vinyl records are better um, and more respectful for representing somebody's art, both visually and, you know, orally. Um, so my take on vinyl LPs is that it's an active learning or listening experience, maybe learning as well. You don't just put it on and whenever you feel like it, you skip over songs. You have to listen to it in a manner that the album composer wanted you to hear it so you have to listen to it linearly from front to end of course you can just start from side b but that's besides the point if you were listening from side a to side b you might notice on some very good albums from the past that it'll start out very strong kind of calm down towards the end of side a and then pick up again on side b and then end, end very strongly on side b so the this like you know, up and down type of nature of songwriting for the album format is because of how the physical uh, media of 12 inch LPs was created. So that's one aspect that I really like about 12 inches. It's very respectful towards the artist. You have to listen to it in a linear fashion. Same with cassette tapes, but you know, cassette tapes. <laughs> uh, they're tiny. I don't know. The, you, get, you, get the, you get the linear. Yeah, but, but they're cheap. Linear component. Yeah, they they used to be cheap. Now they're going up in price, and they're actually more expensive to manufacture than CDs by like double oh, the price. It's it's pretty pretty ridiculous. Yeah. So that's why on the distribution side, a lot of us are seeing drop of tape sales and increase of CD sales lately. Um, yeah, when I was talking to Patrick from Iron Bonehead about that. He doesn't even make tapes anymore for albums, just demo tapes. Mm -hmm. Because demo tapes have this, you know, um, nostalgia and tradition to be on cassette tapes. But um, albums, that's, I, I think I'd rather have it on CDs. And I think at this point, most people would rather have it on CDs. Because to manufacture one tape, you know, for a run of like 200 tapes, it's close to four dollars per tape, whereas with oh the CD, yeah. with the CD um, run of five hundred, it's gonna cost you maybe two dollars per CD, depending on the packaging, of course. But yeah, so it's like half the price, and you get more copies. So I, I think uh, 
Yeah, I think most people will choose um, the CD format if the price, the retail price, ends up being pretty close to each other. I mean, at this point, I'm selling them for about the same price. So, yeah, that that's a total mm -hmm. tangent. So, <laughs> me, this is me trying to convince you of the 12-inch format's superiority. So, uh, I got the audio part out of the way. Um, and you can argue back and forth with audio files about the sound of vinyl versus sound of CDs. I'm not going to get into that because I think that's a tired argument and uh, nobody gives a shit. It's more <laughs> like it, sounds diff it just sounds different because analog, analog uh, media can only capture certain frequencies, you know, and same with CDs. It doesn't, it has its limitations and benefits and they, they're both good formats in my opinion. Um, even tapes have, you know, their limitations and uh, benefits. I, you know, I, I make tapes, so I don't, I don't dislike them, and I also collect them as well because I'm crazy. <laughs> um, yeah, you should see my collection. It's stupid. I don't know why I have so much stuff. It's like, how am I gonna, how am I gonna move this stuff again if I ever move? <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, that's uh, the whole point of starting a label is just so you can trade. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean. The problem is that I keep more than I get rid of, so it's like this this mountain of stuff that I have, and a lot of it is uh, still boxed up from the move like three years ago. So <laughs> you know, this is this is the dilemma. So back back to the benefits of twelve inch format. So, sound quality, yeah. Sound, sound quality, quality or okay. something like that. Yeah, sound quality. I mean, it's cool. I, I mean, nerds will talk about that. I don't really care that much i'm listening to harsh metal most of the time or heavy metal i'm okay with the sound that comes from lps it sounds good to me but unless you're recording fully analog mastering fully analog and then sending a tape into the factory or the the cutting guy it's not going to change that much you know you just master your audio even if it's digitally if you master it properly for the vinyl format you're gonna get pretty close. Um, you're not gonna get as close as like recording and cutting completely analog. That technology is something that is almost gone. It's much harder to pull off. There are places where you, where you can do it, uh, but it's much harder to do. And most people don't do it because it's more expensive. Like recording analog is now much more expensive. Um, yeah, it is. It is intriguing. Whenever I see metal records, especially advertised as being recorded entirely on analog equipment you know i i'm always thinking in the back of my head well is the signal chain being preserved entirely on analog all the way there you know because right. the, the moment it becomes a wave file you've sort of defeated the purpose yeah i've only done it once in my 24 years of running nwn it was for the um nuclear hammer record the first one mm -hmm. um or actually the first one that i did um that was recorded analog. They sent me the two inch reel. I sent the two inch reel to the lacquer cutting guy and uh, and then the, then, you know, the plates were made from that. So it was fully analog from front to end, which was very cool to, cool. Cool to pull off, but it was a pain in the ass for sure. Took a lot more money. So it's just not practical. It makes uh, the records very expensive. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the sound aspect of it. Um, and then lastly, the artwork, you know, there is no comparison. If you're comparing a tape or a CD to a vinyl LP with a 12 inch jacket, that's laid out very nicely with a nice artwork, you know, it's just, there's no comparison between the representation visually to what you can achieve. So that's, that's a huge plus for me coming from a visual background. It, doesn't excite me as much when I get a CD in the mail, even though the layout's nice, it's so small. And with my, you know, my bad vision, I can hardly read the goddamn song titles in the back. <laughs> so I want to hold a 12 inch record in my hand while listening to a record in the fashion that the, the artist wanted me to listen to it, you know, from front to end. So, um, maybe to your point, another dimension of it might be how the thing is made, right? Like it seems, it seems like you've taken a step back from automation, which is pretty cool. Uh, and you've, you've talked about these manual pressing machines. How, how, 
how do those work? What happened? What's the role of the uh, the human worker there? And how? Yeah. Yeah. So it's not so much that I'm against automation. Um, we would like to eventually get it on an automatic machine to increase throughput. On a manual machine, um, there are less moving parts. So basically, the process is like this: you got um, a hopper that contains pellets of vinyl, PVC, and then that is mm -hmm. fed into an extruder, which has an oven inside that melts the PVC to a certain temperature, has to be a very specific temperature, and then it makes a little puck from it, literally looks like a hockey puck. And mm -hmm. that's, that, that's presented to you if it's a more manual machine. If it's an automatic machine, that is presented to the place where the records get pressed. So. Automatic machines have so many more moving parts. So it gives you the puck and then it has to do this suction cup magic where it takes the center labels and puts it on the puck and then, and then there's a machine or robot arm that moves that puck with the center labels to where the stampers are and it has to fall perfectly or the record center labels are off center and it's ruined and you have to start over. And then once the record is pressed, it goes through the heating and cooling cycle. It comes apart. The vinyl record then gets moved by another robotic arm to a trimmer, which trims the excess vinyl around the edge. And then again, there is a suction um, robotic arm that takes the record to a cooling rack. And in any of these steps, if it's off by a couple millimeters, it's all, it's just game over. So automatic, mm -hmm. automatic machines just have so many moving parts. If you don't know how to fix them, if you don't know how to configure them perfectly, then you're kind of shit out of luck. And uh, it also stops the production of records for the entire day or maybe a week, just depends on how long it takes to fix it. Now on the manual side, it's semi-automatic, so it's not it's not 100% manual. It has hydraulics and moving parts, but it's a lot less moving parts. So for a manual machine, it gives you the puck of molten vinyl as a you know as something you have to physically grab from the extruder, and then you put the center labels on manually. You take the puck, you put it in the center of the record, and you make sure it's all perfectly centered. Uh, what's more important about centering are the center labels. They need to be perfectly centered because that, that gives the integrity of the, the center hole. So you put the puck on, and then there are two buttons on the side, side of the machine, so you can't put your hand in there and crush them. So you have to push both buttons at the same time. It presses and brings it into the machine at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it goes through a heating and cooling cycle. So the heating comes first because you have to melt the plastic and get it into the grooves. It has to be heated to the right temperature, otherwise you get burnt vinyl or you get warping or the grooves are not, you know, the grooves might melt together or something. So it's a very finicky manufacturing process. It's not like making like some, you know, plastic injection chair or something. It's a lot more intricate and delicate um, yeah. so then um, the machine presents you with the finished product but it still has excess vinyl around it when it smushes the vinyl it you have to make sure the puck has more vinyl than what's needed to press the record because otherwise you, you know it's kind of useless if the vinyl doesn't go all the way to the edge of the record so on most machines, I think all every single machine, to be honest, um, it will press records with a lot of excess coming out of the edges. So you have to take that mm -hmm. record with all the excess and then put it on a trimmer by hand and then push a button. The machine trims. Once it's trimmed, you take that record and put it on the cooling rack. So all these movements of the record and the puck um, is done by the human being. So we're, we're, the, we're the machine. We're kind of a symbiotic relationship with the manual machine in that aspect and it is literally symbiotic because if you're working an eight hour shift you're in front of that machine for the entire time so you know it 
record pressing sounds glamorous, but it at, at its core, it's just manufacturing work. So, um, you know, I don't want to paint some sort of a romantic picture of manufacturing. A lot of it is just grunt work, but mm-hmm. there's there. There are steps where you can inject your uh, inject some creativity into it. Choosing of different colors and splatter and all that stuff sounds awesome, and I'm really looking forward to doing all of that. So yeah, it's it's maybe closer to early 20th century manufacturing a little, right. as opposed to like the age of digital computerized, you know, airtight control manufacturing. Oh yeah, it's it's yeah. definitely not Tesla. This is yeah. <laughs> this is more like. Uh, one step away from uh, Upton Sinclair's jungle or something. It's a little bit, <laughs> a little bit yeah. less fingers cut. So uh, fingers crossed. Yeah. So, yeah. So now that you have all the groundwork laid for this, do you have a timeline on uh, when production will start? I know it's still dependent on a lot of factors, you getting the machines, getting everything set up, getting labor in Mm -hmm. place, but do you have a rough idea of when you might be able to start producing? So the machines are coming this summer, um, and the last big piece, there are a couple of last big pieces, but we're kind of grouping them all together. Uh, is the infrastructure. Basically, the machines will need to be fed steam, hot steam, to heat up the vinyl, and cold water to cool down the, uh, the vinyl. So these two pieces are like the heart and soul of vinyl manufacturing. Uh, so we have to get a boiler system, and these industrial boiler systems are enormous, and they're enormously expensive. Um, and then the other component is the water chiller, it's kind of like a exaggerated air conditioning machine. It's just like an industrial sized air conditioning machine. So in, in, in fact, a lot of these uh, water chillers are used in buildings to cool the building down. So as the air conditioning it is not much of a difference. So uh, these two components probably will cost us around $300,000 and we're doing a Kickstarter in March, which I'll go into a little bit later when we start talking about that. Um, but yeah, so the unknowns are when we can reach this goal of getting the money to buy the boiler and chiller, how long it takes for these boiler and chillers to be delivered because there's, it's not like you go to Home Depot and just buy them, you know, they don't sell them just to anyone. You have to go through this waiting period of them making it each of these things are custom made um so it might be another six months or something before they're made so if we hit the target we need for money by the end of end end of march then you know by september we might have the boiler and chiller and then we can put them in get all the engineering done in terms of the piping Electrical work also needs to be done. We need three phase. We need to add a couple more units of air conditioning in there because it's Texas. Uh, Water treatment is a big issue with these machines. Um, So we have to have soft water. Basically all the minerals need to be removed. That system needs to be put in place. Bunch of pumps to move the water around the pipes that needs to be in place. So um, we're exploring multiple revenue streams uh, kickstarter is one we're looking at getting a loan from the city of brady because they can provide uh, lower interest loans to s- smaller businesses like us we're going to run a sale probably uh, through nwn um, yeah we're pulling every lever i might cash out my bitcoin or something um, i don't want to but you know it is what it is so yeah, end of the end of this year is the target for pressing records. Yeah, to uh, to really break ground. Um, well, what's going to be the first thing? I mean, it's got to be a, a nuclear war now release, right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's already um, set in stone. It's going to be blasphemies, fallen angel doom because <laughs> perfect yeah. makes sense. Yeah, yeah. In, yeah. in fact, I already um, I already got the stampers made. They're in my office. 
<laughs> Very nice. nice. So yeah. that was probably that was already planned back in 2019 or something. Yeah, it, it, was, it was planned at, at birth or something. You know, like <laughs> it was it was destined to be like that. Yeah, there's not really a, a more sense. nuclear war now choice than that. For right, right, that is the signature release. So, um, yeah, it's natural that I would do that one. Well, that's a I, well, that's kind of a an interesting thing in and of itself because I was going to ask you. Um, now that you've been running NWN for, I, I think you said something like 24 years now. Yeah. Yeah. So I had a couple questions about that. One, has this actually finally become a full-time job for you or are you still doing double duty with a day job? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, so last winter I finally quit my day job of 20 something years i lost count and because the company got acquired by another company so i don't know where the start date is now but mm-hmm. yeah I, I worked there for 20 plus years um it was a biotech company called agilent technologies i'm very grateful for my employment there because um, it just allowed me to do nwn on the side at night and um live the dream eventually of quitting that job and focusing on uh, my passion, which is music. Well, that, so. that's that's something that interests me because, you know, when we have people on the show, I tend to ask questions oriented, uh, you know, at least occasionally around kind of the business side of this music because it is mm-hmm. such a, a tough thing to do. Um, at this point, Nuclear War Now is like a standard bearer label of mm-hmm. extreme music and underground metal in general, but it was a long path to get here. So... I wanted to know, like, in your opinion, was there a a particular time or maybe even a particular release that brought Nuclear War now more toward where we see it today? You know, after doing, you know, scrappy underground stuff, was there something that Mm -hmm. really pushed it forward and made you think, oh, man, this could be like a a real future for this as a business? Uh. Yeah, it's it's hard to say because I feel like I've been doing the same thing for my my entire career with NWN. If you look back on the catalog, like going all the way back to the very first release, it was Blasphemy's Live Ritual record. You know, I mean, that wasn't the very first catalog release, but it was the first significant vinyl release. It was it was the first vinyl release on NWN. So mm-hmm. I count that as my first release essentially. Before that, I was just doing some stupid tapes by. A project that I was doing with my friend Jason, so those don't really count. Blasphemy's live ritual was the beginning, and then here we are, 24 years later, and I'm still working with Blasphemy, and my taste hasn't changed that much. Maybe the only difference is that um, I'm listening to a little bit more heavy metal, so my catalog is now like I don't know, 50% black death metal, and there's a little bit of thrash old thrash and then there's a big chunk of heavy metal now that i've been releasing mostly old because i don't really like new heavy metal but as i get older i think maybe my taste is changing slightly towards rock and heavy metal and but other than that nothing's really changed as far as my taste in music and you know business wise i've gotten smarter i I think if if you're if you're in this for the long run, you have to actually <laughs> actually care about paying bills, and you know you have to do that with currency. You can't just do it with goodwill or records. Although I have traded records for food before. <laughs> yeah. You can't pay rent or mortgage with records uh, you unless have you first... have a really cool landlord. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. You have to first turn it into money, and then and then the magic happens of paying rent or. <laughs> mortgage so yeah you have to do that alchemy first here's a sort of nwn and uh record pressing sort of question uh Mm -hmm. what is the worst supply chain cluster fuck that happened to you during the lockdowns because you had to rely on records pressed in in czechia or wherever um there were multiple failures during the, the pandemic, but the worst was the fact that all the flights were grounded. And most people don't know this, but most air freight goes on passenger planes. So when people stopped flying, air freight prices went 
crazy, so you couldn't send anything by mm. air freight anymore. It had to be sent by boats on sea freight. And you can imagine, you know, the Titanic coming across all the way from Europe. <laughs> Those things take forever, you know? <laughs> they take, mm -hmm. like, two months to cross the Atlantic. And you don't know, like, I had one shipment from China that was, like, on the news because the boat capsized or something, and, and they lost <laughs> a bunch of um, bunch of uh, freight. Luckily, my freight was at the bottom, and it didn't get uh, it didn't get lost, but it added like six or seven months to the the journey. So Jeez, definitely, yeah. uh, just having um, air freight just one day disappear that was crazy. That that just of all the different things, that was the worst because it just added two to three months more to the um, to the pipeline of getting records back. So it would take like mm -hmm. at the beginning it was like okay it's gonna take you know three to four months or whatever it used to be two months now it's three to four and then it just started getting longer and longer until it was like more than one year to get your records back and by then like the bands were just complaining and yeah it, it was a okay really bad time yeah that actually helps me explain that time better because I remember the huge leaps in uh Release, release dates getting pushed further and further back and mm -hmm. a lot of labels having problems and I guess it makes sense because they're planning everything on a timetable designed for air freight but then right. suddenly that timetable gets like quadrupled or more than that. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. It was a multifactorial problem but the air freight part was the most annoying because I felt like uh they could have fixed it by just you know flying cargo instead and mm -hmm. trying to deal with it but they just grounded the grounded the planes so nothing was coming over for a little bit um yeah i mean those were very annoying times but i feel like when you're under pressure and and you got problems that's when you really have to work hard and figure out solutions otherwise you don't survive so during those times is when i really adjusted my business mindset as well and started to focus a lot more on distribution because I couldn't get my records back from the factories fast enough. So I had to buy other people's records to keep the distro going. Um, the good thing was the, you know, the pandemic just put a bunch of money into people's pockets. They were just printing money mm -hmm. like nothing, you know. You remember getting the PPP check in the mail? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everyone pretty yeah. much spent, any metalhead that I know, pretty much spent that check on records or something metal related. So it was great for the underground economy for those uh, couple of months there. You know? I got I got some tattoos with mine, so. <laughs> yeah. That, that's there when we go. started, that's when we, that's when we started the show because we knew it was time to grift. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, 2020 was an interesting time. Um, we had to adjust accordingly. Otherwise, he just went under. You know, like it was a do or die time. So I chose to do, and I probably broke a bunch of laws working in the warehouse. And you know, my, <laughs> because we were supposed to be so-called essential workers, so we were supposed to stay home, but. You know, I was running a mail order business, so I could just, as long as I, I could get to the warehouse and get to the post office without getting caught by the cops, everything was okay. And um, luckily, I was in such a shitty location in Oakland, East Oakland, that the cops didn't just, didn't care. So, <laughs> you know, they probably just figured that we were just going there to buy drugs or something. So, <laughs> my commute to the warehouse from the house was like 15 minutes and I go through a nice area at the beginning but it's mostly shit after that so luckily the entire time the the shutdown was happening in California I was able to work and my workers were also happy that they were able to work um, because otherwise they would have just been stuck inside doing nothing and not getting paid 
So they were happy that they, they could get paid under the table. They're mm -hmm. coming to the warehouse, and we continued the operation throughout the entire pandemic. We didn't even take one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice, nice. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe Gavin Newsom will come after me now for saying this. Um, <laughs> well, 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 now that you're uh, now that you're you've moved operations to Austin, we can we can nuke Oakland for more of it. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so, but uh, um, I, I, so, I still have friends over there, so not yet. I, I know, I know, I know. Yeah. Um, but um, the uh, so here's another question about employment. Then, so I figure at the new factory, right at Helios, it'll be of course you'll be employing a lot of people from the scene. Um, but it, will there be some, pr probably, I'd assume, some opportunities for employing some just regular people from, uh, from Brady? Yeah, well, actually, there's no scene there to speak of, and it's also two hours away. So my guess is that we'll right. be hiring just locals, um, mostly, oh, work. you know, yeah. blue-collar workers who used to work in concrete factories or whatever. Um, as long as they're okay with working machinery, then I think they'll be okay. Um, cool. Yeah, so the plan at the beginning is to just, uh, you know, for me and my uh, my business partner to just work longer hours um, out of the necessity of just getting the, the factory off the ground and learning the art of vinyl pressing. So at the beginning, it'll just be the two of us learning how to press. We'll learn um, on the job using NWN records. I promised everyone I won't put those into circulation if they come out crappy i will perfect the art before i start selling them so at the beginning hopefully it doesn't take too long maybe a month maybe a month and a half i don't know but we'll get that perfected before we start pressing real records um and then at the beginning just out of uh, financial necessity it will just be us working long ass hours pressing records mm -hmm. Yeah, but eventually the goal is to you know hire enough people. We have four presses. You need one person per press, so four pressing uh, press operators. There needs to be a plant manager. There needs to be somebody assembling the records. There needs to be somebody doing QC work. Um, so all these things, um, you know, we're at the end of the day, it's probably about ten people that we'll need to hire in Brady, Texas. But the city itself is super happy there. You know, <laughs> I have some funny stories about that. We were there to sign the, um, the the closing documents for the building, and we're in we're in the building um, where they do the signing, and uh, the title company. The name escapes me. Yeah, <laughs> and everyone already knew us. Like everyone in the entire building knew us. So that was that was a little weird. And then afterwards. Oh, good thing they didn't know uh, what I was doing, though. They don't know about nuclear war now. And Brady, they're all... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But they knew, they knew of us, and they knew that we were starting a vinyl pressing plant. So they were super happy to have us. And so we were looking for... After that, we were looking for an accountant. So we just randomly walk into an accounting office. And again, the entire room is aware of us. So... <laughs> So then we're, we're told to go to the local radio station because they wanted to interview us. So we go in there and everyone in the room, again, knew everything about us. Um, it's a tiny town, you know, maybe like a couple thousand people in that town. So already the, oh yeah, so then we were interviewed by the radio station and it apparently aired the next day. We didn't hear it because it, it was just like, you know, AM or FM or something. Um, so now the, the entire city knows about us which is really weird um but it's also very good because it should be easy to hire well, yeah. so, and, and now obviously the next nwn festival has to take place in brady ah uh, mm. yeah perhaps they the, have the uh, new metal mecca of the south <laughs> they have they have an awesome um preserved train station that we were looking at stupidly I might add. We're looking at this awesome, it was like a turn of the century train station that was preserved and it was, uh, it even has a little plaque, you know, historical plaque. And uh, it's completely decked out inside, nice wooden um, moldings and uh, carvings inside. Everything is perfectly preserved. 
and we actually put in a bid on it to put the factory inside, but I'm glad it fell through because it made absolutely no sense to press wreckers at the train station. <laughs> <laughs> like there was no, it wasn't even big enough to house all the machinery. We just thought it was a cool idea, so we put in a bid and it got rejected. But that, that building would be perfect for a venue. Well, well, eventually, once the operation grows, you can use that to bring in trains with, uh, you know, vinyl yeah, shipments. Heads, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just do, we're just bussing them in from all corners of the country to, to Brady, Texas. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about that idea of, uh, of uh, live shows, not necessarily in Brady, but in more far-flung places. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, collaboration with Hospital Productions in Japan that's coming up? Yeah, so this is kind of um, once in a lifetime opportunity that was that was uh, and it just kind of happened. Um, all the stars aligned and it just came together so perfectly. I feel like it was a religious moment. I'm I'm not a religious person, but I felt just like cosmic energy of bringing all the bands together, um, especially in my home country of Japan, especially in Osaka, where I've always liked because they have great food. But the mm. attitude of Osaka is a little bit more rough. Uh, I feel like they have more of a fuck you attitude compared to Tokyo. It's kind of a, it's a little bit more rough and dirty and blue collar. So it was perfect that we were able to do it in Osaka. And it was also perfect that we got Beherit, Genocide Organ, you know, Sabbath, Departure Chandelier, Blasphemy, Masona, and all the bands Ooh. that are playing. I mean, it was just... It's a it's an insane lineup. It's yeah, completely it's, 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 fucking ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's like, uh, for anybody into extreme music and extreme electronics, this, this is the, uh, you know, holy mecca of a festival that could happen because the, the, the most perfect thing is, is the hair because they started out as a black metal band, but in the middle there in the nineties, he started doing electronic music. And then in the two thousands, he was doing noise music as well. So he just, he just fits in so perfectly with the concept of this festival where the first night is focused on NWN bands and it's all metal, mostly black and death metal. And then the second day, you know, it's it's all electronic experimental music. So everything mm. just kind of fit together perfectly. Um, and the fact that this will be Beharit's first gig outside of Europe, um, they just played their first comeback gig in Finland. And I believe they're going to play one other gig in Italy or something before coming to Osaka. But it will be their first gig outside of Europe, um, which is very special for us. I, I feel very honored that this was able to come together so perfectly. Um, you mentioned that you had some friends who wanted to come. Unfortunately, unless they find a ticket on the secondary market, we're sold out. Oh, I think they were just going to break in. It's okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Breaking in is also welcome. <laughs> Any sort of crime and violence. <laughs> we support that. <laughs> keeping keeping with real tradition of the yeah, Japanese yeah. noise scene. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, do illegal things in Japan. <laughs> so so how has that been, you know, I mean just I guess one thing that really interests me is that so just in your position in the metal scene, you've run a label, you've become a a promoter that's put on big successful festivals. Uh, you're working on the vinyl pressing plant, uh, and you've you've done. I, I know that you've done a lot of sort of visual art stuff as well, um, you know, and obviously handling layouts and graphic design for bands. But one thing that you haven't really stepped into, at least as far as I know, is playing music yourself. Um, do you yeah. play any instruments, or has that no, never I, been the focus of your your interest? I've always wanted to, but at this point in my life, I'm 48. I'm musically retarded, so I can't. <laughs> I, I'm stunted in some ways. Um, and I, I, if I had the time, I would definitely learn to play the guitar or drums or something. But at this point, my time is so stretched thin that I can't. Maybe in the next life. Um, yeah, I don't believe in reincarnation, but 
hopefully that's true <laughs> and I can come back as a musician next time I really want to well, that's that's just yeah. really interesting to me, you know, because so much of this scene flows out of people um, wanting to play the music, and yet you have become this very important person to the scene by doing everything Hello? except for that, which kind of puts you in a, a unique position. Um, I was, uh, in, yeah, in, yes. So, yeah, in in preparation for this, for instance, I was reading your uh, interview you did with Bardo Methodology a few years back, and it seems mm-hmm. like. Maybe as a result of not being a musician yourself, you focus on some things that a lot of us musicians will sort of push by the wayside. Like your your focus on um, aesthetics and a real appreciation of visual art and the physical objects within metal. Um, could you touch on that a little bit? Because you, you really... You seem to have a very defined vision for what extreme metal should look and feel like. Yeah, I mean, visual art is very subjective, but I think there is some baseline goodness, you know, a line where you can draw and anything below that is bullshit, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and the, it's one of these things, like, when you see porn, you know what it is. When you see bad layout, you know what it is. Um, <laughs> like, if you look at one of these... Photoshop diarrheas, like uh, children of Bodom cover or something, where it's like, yeah. you know what I'm talking about? They got some, like, big titty girl or something uh, photoshopped on top of some demon, you know, that kind of artwork. Yeah. If you can call it art, you know. That's clearly below that objective line of good or bad. What I'm trying to do is, you know, elevate metal to something above that line, at least. <laughs> So my taste is more grounded in something analog. Um, I don't like anything digital. I try to tolerate some things that the bands want to do themselves, but I tend to really dislike anything that's like Photoshoppy, you know, drop shadows, 3D effects. Um, even drawing on a digital pad, I don't like because I can usually tell that it was done that way. A lot of analog artists are now scanning pictures or just taking pictures online and drawing on top of them digitally. And I, I don't like that concept either. I, I like everything to be analog 100% if possible. Uh, doing layouts in, uh, in a digital tool is one thing, but the actual cover and the logo needs to be hand drawn. I don't like anything that's not. Um, so that, that's like, I guess that's the, the basics that I start out with, um, when it comes to album covers, I tend to like eighties covers because they just didn't have the technology. They had to do it by hand. So even, even the layouts were basically cut and pasted and photographed, you know, or the entirety of the cover was painted or drawn and then photographed. So even like the typography was done by hand using rub-on letters and such. Um, and it just gives it a human touch, an imperfection that um, lends itself to, uh, I don't know, it gives it a different aesthetic than a perfectly aligned typography done on a computer. You know, for example, early Sabbath records and CDs, especially CDs, um, are reference points for what I want to achieve with a lot of my layouts because Gazol was a visual geni- genius back then. Um, he was using rub-on letters. He was cutting out pictures from magazines that he wanted to use in the layout. Um, like if you look at the old Evil Records CDs that he produced himself, everything was just so perfect. Uh, the the rub-on letters of, you know, he often used old English rub-on letters. They were not perfectly aligned. But that gave it more flavor, you know. It was just it gave it a special magic that you can't achieve. Even if you try to achieve that in Photoshop and like readjust the letters so they're not perfect, it just looks fake. You know, it's like a, it's like eating fake meat or something. You know, it's not meat. It's it's kind of like that. Um, yeah, there. So yeah, visual aesthetics are very important to me. Um, I can't exactly describe 
why they're important to me. I guess it's one of those things. Um, I came from a visually oriented family. My my family, my mom, exposed me to a lot of visual art at an early age. So it's it's somewhere in my brain, floating around. Um, unfortunately, they never made me play an instrument. I wish they had. I was gonna say I wasted a lot of time skateboarding as a you know preteen and teenager. <laughs> I wish I had you know played a guitar instead, like normal nerds. <laughs> yeah, I skateboarded yeah. instead. But yeah, so um, question about just just a uh, quick question for a lot of people listening, they might not know what a rub on letter is. For instance, I've always been too lazy to DIY. So what what is a rub on letter? So they're essentially like uh, stickers. Um, so there there are semi sticky letters on transparencies, and mm -hmm. what you do is. You take something like a pen and uh, you put the sticky side against the paper so you're scratching against uh, the transparency, right? Mm -hmm. So you scratch out the letter until it sticks to the paper and you just repeat that process until you have a word or sentence okay. or right. song title or something, you know? So mm -hmm. you can see that if you don't align it perfectly and there's like no real way to align it perfectly because you're just mm -hmm. eyeballing it. Right. But yeah. because of that, you're trying to achieve perfection, but there's no way to achieve perfection. So the the inherent imperfections are giving it more flavor for that reason. I, I feel <laughs> like it's like perfect uh, analogy for why AI art sucks. And human created art always has this extra formula, this extra flavor that AI art just cannot achieve. Yet, at least, I don't know, maybe AI will surpass us and it'll, it'll fool me with great analog looking layouts. <laughs> uh, about, um, also, you, you talked about skating as a waste of time, but I've got to assume that that helped set you up in some ways for NWN. Like, I mean, you, I think on the, that self interview you did with your buddy, I think mm -hmm. he or you mentioned something about you knowing Pusshead. Wasn't he involved in the skate scene? And the Blasphemy yeah. guys were skaters too, right? Yeah, it's funny. Almost everyone I speak to from the metal scene skated at some point. So there must be some linkage to the creativity of skateboarding to creativity of metal music and punk music and hardcore music so yeah i mean i don't regret skateboarding i just what i said was more of a joke i i wish i had done both yeah, yeah, yeah. and get playing mm -hmm. a lot of people did so i was you know i'm the loser who only skated um <laughs> skate, skateboarding back in the late 80s and early 90s was not hip-hop you know right now if you look at a skate video it's all hip-hop but back then yeah skateboarding was completely tied to underground punk hardcore and metal so i don't i don't know pusshead i knew people around pusshead in san francisco um our our good friend rick thrasher who used to work with thrasher for many years he was the roadie for septic death when they moved from idaho to san francisco and oh, sick. he he worked for Pusshead's label, um, Pusmort, for many years, and uh, I think he was involved in the release of the Sacrilege record. Um, so yeah, that's my connection to the Pusshead thing. Not much, nothing else. Right, right. Uh, I've always liked Pusshead. I think in that context of skateboarding, I, I probably mentioned that um, Pusshead used to write articles in Thrasher magazine for many years, like going back to the mid eighties, he had a column, I think it was called Pus, Pus Zone or something, where he reviewed, uh, you know, whatever albums that, that was uh, sent to him. Um, mm -hmm. One of which was the Witch's Hammer 12 inch uh, that I reissued later on. So that was oh, like cool. in yeah, yeah. 1986 or 1987, Pus reviewed this thing and then, you know, 2022 or 24 i don't remember what year when i reissued that but i reissued that on nwn so you know skateboarding pus head nwn it all kind of came uh full circle yeah the um uh the which for listeners uh witch's hammer was a speed metal band uh from from british columbia that was sort of 
proto blasphemy, right? One, there's they share a member, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Traditional sodomizer um, was the original guitar player for Witch's Hammer. Witch's Hammer started way early, like '82 or something. They were already playing, and their first demos are from like the mid '80s. And they did a self-release 12 inch in the mid '80s as well. The first, the very first Blast B gig in 1988 was Witch's Hammer and Blast for Me opening. Um, so there's always been this linkage. They're from the same town. Um, mm -hmm. And then Marco, traditional sodomizer of Goddess Diversity, he ended up joining <laughs> Blast for Me um, right before they recorded um, Fallen Angel Doom. So. If you look on the back of Fallen Angel Doom, he's the enormous guy with the devil's mask. And uh, he's like, his entire body is uh, painted white. He looks he looks really fucked up and crazy. <laughs> and, nice. Oh, yeah. He's, he's, he's on Instagram. Um, he still looks crazy, but in a different way. Now he's a bodybuilder. So he's completely ripped. And he's got like this crazy six pack. And his arm is like bigger than my leg. Yeah. So... Yeah, Marco Tyrant's blood. If you want to look it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I actually follow that one. Yes. Yeah, yeah. He's he's uh he's inspirational. Actually, he's awesome. So, well, now now that you've got it, it seems to me that you're a guy that within your pursuits of NWN and within the metal scene, you're constantly looking for like the next big challenge. So, after the record pressing plant. What what's the next one? Sending NWN to like a Mars colony or huh. you know? I haven't thought that far out. First things first, we have to get Helios up and running, and we'll take it from there. You know, I'm I'm focusing a lot on health because I do want to do more uh, after Helios. I don't know what, and who knows what's the, what that's gonna be, but. You know, I, I got to live a little bit longer than a normal human being in order to achieve that. So yeah, I, there's there's no surrendering. That's why we named the festival Never Surrender. We won't stop until we're dead. This pit goes out to this whole army of darkness. Let me see the charge. 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 Let me see